Awesome. Um, hello and welcome to today's webinar, Building Dementia Inclusion into Intergenerational Programming. My name is Inda Sali. I'm the CEO of Families Canada, and it is my pleasure to be the moderator for today's session. I would like to start by acknowledging that Families Canada's main office is located in Ottawa, which is built on the traditional unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. The Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this territory. For today's webinar, we are joined by a panel of experts in dementia awareness and inclusion and intergenerational and community programming. The speakers will share and discuss their expertise and experiences in creating dementia inclusive spaces and programs. And during this hour, we will reflect on challenges and barriers faced by individuals with dementia in accessing programming and hear about strategies that work to create more dementia inclusive programming, especially intergenerational programming. And at the end of the panel discussion, we will open the floor for any thoughts, comments or questions from the audience. Um, before we start, I have a few housekeeping notes that I'll just quickly get through. Uh, please note that today's session will be recorded. The recording will be shared on Families Canada's YouTube channel after the session. So please feel free to keep the video on or off as you prefer. Um, you can write your questions and comments in the chat box or raise uh, your hand with the raise hand button if you'd like to speak. Um, if you have any technical questions or difficulties, please uh, uh, feel free to message our project officer, Bushra Rahman, via the chat, and she'll do her best to help you out. So with that, let's begin. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our esteemed panelists for today's session. Josie Leduc, Education Coordinator at Alzheimer Society Cornwall and District, provides education and support to people living with dementia, their families, care partners, the public in general, and healthcare professionals. She coordinates a variety of highly stimulating activities and educational programs and has led workshops on various related topics. Her work has focused on raising awareness that, that there is a life after the diagnosis of dementia. Share. She's done a lot more, but we don't have uh, all, a, a lot of time today. So let's move on to our next uh, panelist, uh, Katrina Van Es, uh, Director of Planning at Champlain, <clears throat> excuse me, Dementia Network. She was the project manager for the Stronger Together project, making Ottawa and Renfrew County dementia inclusive. The project focused on reducing the stigma associated with dementia so that people living with dementia feel supported, valued, and respected. After a 40-year career in the financial sector, she retired and found a way to give back to her community through the work of this project. And as all other panelists, and I'll repeat this again, there's a lot more on her bio, of course, but uh, I'd like to move on now to our third panelist, Betty Good. Betty Good is from Goodlings Intergenerational P Practice. She's a visionary educator with more than 40 years of Canadian and international experience. Uh, recently, she dedicated more than eight years to Linkages Society of Alberta. As the program and training lead, she spearheaded intergenerational programs to create more inclusive, connected, and vibrant communities. She has also provided training to help other organizations in implementing intergenerational programs. And when Linkages was forced to close its doors last fall due to underfunding, Betty initiated a social enterprise, continuing her passion for intergenerational generational work um, and uh, again there's a lot more on the bio that I'm sure you'd be interested to read uh, we'll be providing links later uh, a warm welcome to all of you thank you so much Josie Katrina and Betty for joining us I do have some specific questions for each of you but I would like to start with an opening question to everyone on the panel um, you, as you know, it is estimated then that more than half a million Canadians over the age of 65 are living with diagnosed dementia. And as the population ages, that number is expected to rise. So based on your experiences, uh, could you uh, share why you think dementia inclusion and creating dementia inclusive spaces is so important within community programming and specifically uh, when it comes to intergenerational programming? 
Um, so I'll, I'll just call on each of you. Let's start with you, Josie. Um, what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> well, the number are, are increasing incredibly. Um, it's true, it's more than uh, 500,000 people that are living with dementia past the age of 65, but we do have to keep in mind that a lot of people that are living with dementia are living with young onset dementia, which is dementia before the age of 65. So that means there's um, there's quite a bit of people involved in, in on their journey supporting these people. So we definitely need um, inclusion of, of intergenerative the generational to to um to support these people because without that i don't know uh it, it i can say that it, it won't be good that's all i can say absolutely um yeah. and let me pass the mic thank you thank you josie let me pass the mic to betty betty what do you think Okay, well, my experience has been in the intergenerational field, and a lot of our programs included people living with dementia, including one program which um, I took junior high school students over to a care center, and in order to be a resident of that care center, they needed to have mid to late dementia. And I think by having this by including people living with dementia in our society, it actually gives them dignity. It helps with the social isolation. And for the students, it really promotes compassion, empathy, and understanding. And it's kind of scary for young people if they haven't had the experience of being with a person who has dementia. And so for the students, it really helps them to gain a better understanding. And then they're not afraid. And they just, they're just are included in that population. Such an important point. Thank you, Betty. And, and over to you now, Katrina. What are your thoughts on why this is so important? Uh, yes, thank you. I, I do think that uh, Betty touched on the importance of introducing early on, so with school-age children, um, and teaching them about what it means for someone to have dementia um, and how they might interact with that person. Uh, we did several training sessions with grade seven and eight students in the city of Arnprior, and it was amazing how accepting the students were, um, how enthusiastic they were to learn yeah. about uh, dementia, to learn about how they can communicate with a person living with dementia, and how they can kind of uh, recognize the warning signs. And it's uh, our belief, too, that, you know, if we do a good job teaching our children about dementia and encouraging compassion and empathy and, and caring, that that will pave the way for them going forward, which may also then encourage them as young adults to seek careers that specialize in geriatrics and dementia. The other thing I'd like to mention is that, you know, we know that as people age, they would like to stay in their homes and they would like to continue to participate and contribute in their communities. So in order to remove the stigma associated with dementia, I think we need to ensure that everyone understands what dementia is, how they can communicate with a person living with dementia, and how they can spot the warning signs. And by providing the education through people and the general public, uh, by way of training sessions and webinars, I think we can increase and have much greater awareness and acceptance of dementia. Thank you, Katrina. And that's really why we, we embarked on this project as well. It's, especially in the family support setting, I think it's so important that we know people are placed within the context of so many people around them of all ages. Uh, and that's being part of the community. And, and now I have a question again back to you, Betty. Uh, you had spent many years creating and leading successful intergenerational programs. And, and, and just as we were talking, you know, that means bringing together uh, more than one generation. Um, what do you see as some of the greatest challenges and benefits of developing intergenerational programming that is dementia 
inclusive and accessible to people living with dementia. I think you're on mute, Betty. Sorry. When I started with linkages and facilitating programs, our flagship programs were in care centers. And so usually we took 26 students to a care center and we had 13 residents that we matched with the students. And of course it was long-term care. So not all of them had dementia, but many of them did. So the challenge at the beginning that I had to learn was we had to train the students how to interact with people who had dementia. And um, and and after once we started doing that, it wasn't a challenge because the students understood what they were facing. They understood how to interact and what they what to expect. Another challenge, uh, I mentioned before that one of the programs was in the care center where they all had mid to late dementia. The challenge wasn't with the students because we did extensive training. The challenge was with the residents because um, they may not want to be there. They may get tired of playing this game, so they would just get up and walk away. <laughs> but how we overcame that was, um, and, and some of the challenges you couldn't overcome depending on what they were, but there was staff always present. And so if, for example, if Eddie said, well, I have to leave because dinner is at the table, um, she could jump in and she could kind of diffuse that. And she knew how to talk to Eddie to get him to stay for another 10 minutes. And, and so, with the students, I often told them in the training, I said that the staff member, the rec therapist who was there, her name was Stacy. And I said, you know, whenever Stacy is talking to somebody, watch what she does. And so those actually were the main challenges. With the students, if we did things right, there were no challenges because the students were amazing. Now, did you ask about benefits too, or just challenges? Yes, yes. Uh so for the benefits, I liked what Katerina said, that um, a huge benefit, and we've experienced this with some of our students, they have chosen career paths that led into healthcare. And we had one student who was in our program in grade 12 or in high school. Then he went on to volunteer at this care center that I was telling you about. And now he's in university and his focus is um, dementia and Alzheimer's and brain. Yeah, so that's amazing. And like I said before too, just to understand, to understand and to have empathy and to learn how to speak to people with dementia and to realize they're people, they're people and treat them with respect and you can have a relationship with them. At the end of one of our programs, I always I always did a debrief with the students before they left the care center because I wanted to know if there were challenges that they faced and help them to do some problem solving. And I also wanted them to leave feeling really good about having been there and looking forward to the next visit. And in one of the debriefs, one of the students said, just because they have dementia doesn't mean we can't have a relationship because I have a great relationship with my senior friend. So the benefits are endless, especially for the students. It's amazing. Uh, really, you know, but those are the outcomes that you really hope for. Um, yeah. And it's a, it's a, a good segue for my next question, which is, you know, to look more at strategies that people could actually implement in their day-to-day -day work. So um, um, let me turn to you, Katerina. Um, in your work with the Stronger Together Project, you developed a playbook that uh, communities and organizations can use to develop strategies for becoming more dementia inclusive. Uh, could you share with our participants here some of your key takeaways that you think are essential? Um, and especially, you know, I think that would be useful for our 
audience as they either continue or begin their journey to be more dementia inclusive? Um, yes, of course. So the, the playbook is available to anyone online at the um, Dementia Society of Ottawa and Renfrew's website, which is called DementiaHelp.ca. And the playbook provides a step-by-step -step, um, plan of what you can do to create um, a dementia-inclusive community, as well as uh, resources and access to some of the training modules that we created. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, some of the key takeaways from this work was that it was really important in order to be successful and create a dementia inclusive community is to um, scale down your approach. So initially we were going to go out and do the entire city of Ottawa. And I mean, that was just too large and overwhelming a task to undertake because it all comes down to developing relationships with people. So what we did is we selected the town of Arnprior, Ontario to participate in our project. They're in Ren Renfrew County between Ottawa and uh, going uh, west towards um, Barry's Bay. Anyway, the town of Arnprior or the community of Arnprior, they have a specific objective to create a dementia friendly community. So they were a perfect partner for our project. And what we did is we worked with a community we developed relationships, which meant spending many days going to Arnprior, getting to know the local people, getting to know the president of the seniors council, getting to know the local politicians, the mayor, uh, the head or the director of um, uh, um, uh, recreational activities, et cetera. Once those relationships were developed, then we felt that we had earned the right to start talking to them about putting some groundwork down for creating dementia inclusive um, uh, retail spaces or programming. Um, so what we did is, as I said, we partnered with the Seniors Council and we created a week long focus on dementia. The week was called Better Ways, Better Days. It started with a flag raising ceremony and a speech by the mayor officially launching the week. Then we held an information fair where we invited, of course, a Dementia Society um, staff to come and um, have booths set up whereby we, um, we had topics that people could learn from dementia and about dementia. And we also had the local support uh, services and agencies present at the information fair so that people could also learn about the local services and supports that were available right there in their community. Throughout the week, we also offered um, numerous training sessions. So as I mentioned, we trained school-age children, grade seven and eights. We trained the cadets, the um, paramedics, the fire department, uh, Royal Bank of Canada employees attended a training session, Davis and Hearing, Arm Prior Obstacle, uh, Optical, the grocery stores, coffee shops, and Giant Tiger, which is a large retail store in uh, smaller towns. The residents of, of Arm Prior showed great interest and they really wanted to get involved and learn more about dementia and how they could support the people living in their community with dementia. That's uh, amazing. Um, and, and really, you know, highlights the importance, which we are seeing also in our work uh, about what you said about relationships. It's not really just parachuting in some activities and then it's, you know, and you're in and out. It's really developing those relationships. Um, and so I'd like to ask you, Jose, just on that note, you work very closely with care partners and families of individuals living with dementia. What are some ways that community organizations, such as, you know, uh, which has been represented in this forum today, how can uh, they better reach and engage with families and care partners to ensure that people living with dementia can have access to programs? Well, first of all, I want to say, wow, well, ladies, uh, Katerina and Betty, that's awesome. Uh, my, I, I'm, I'm just amazed uh, by the wonderful work you do. My scope of expertise is more on, on the education level. So I, there's, there's a long way to go, but it's beautiful. I am, I'm, I'm just so blessed to, to, to hear what you, you, you just shared. Um, yes, I, I, there's one, one thing I can say uh, to 
to answer your question, Zindu, is, is listening to people that are living with dementia. They are, I refer to them, uh, working with them as my board of director. Um, most of us know that 50% of people are aware of their loss. So, I mean, they are expert in, in sharing with us, with me, their needs, um, what they like, what they don't like, things they can do to prepare so for what's to come. And, and um, being able to, to share that with their care partner, uh, then it it's, makes it actually easier for us to support our care partner because, hey, they are the expert. Um, so I always say in order for people to be supported is, is, is to reach out for help, whether it's the Dementia Society, whether the, it's the Alzheimer's Society in, in, in our catchment area, reach out. Um, Care, care partner will share with us because we we definitely support care partner in order for better support people with dementia, right? If they are trained adequately, if they are shown, if they are uh, um, understood, um, it'll be easier for them to, to communicate with their loved ones. So it's kind of a catch-22 here. Um, so all that to say is, is um, listen to the people. Um, we have a lot of program. I, I, I did have the opportunity to, to educate students into schools, uh, actually in one school, uh, pre-pandemic, um, to prepare them to go visit um, people with dementia in a long-term care. The way it happened is our client happened to be the teacher of those students. So we need more and more advocate to open those door to have us coming and, and educate our student. And, and, and the thing, and you kind of touch on it, uh, Betty and, and, and Katerina, is the students are so open. They were grade five and grade six, and they're so open. They wanted to know more about the brain. and. Oh my God, they were just amazing. And the visit I did with them to the people with dementia at that long-term care was priceless. So I, I just hope that now that we're post-pandemic, I hope that we'll resume and, and to get where you guys are, Betty and Kat, where we can we can really do that, that um uh, that education with with our young people and with with the public in general, because doing that in 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 my work, I, I learned so much that a lot of people are just not aware of it. They're mm -hmm. not aware. The education is is we 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 do a lot, but there's still a long way to go. I can say that in ten years, things ch changed quite a bit, and we've learned so much in in the dementia world with the pandemic because the socialization we know the impact it had uh i know on my clients i would say unfortunately i i i i, I would lost half of them to either long-term care or they're no longer with us so anyway all that to say guys are doing such a good job Thank you, Josie. And, and, and really a, an important reminder for us as well to put the person at the center of all our work and, and, to, and, and to always keep in mind that people are the expert of their lived experiences and their own lives. Um, and, and you've touched on it, and I think all our panelists have touched on it, and I'd just like to take some more minutes. Uh, I think we have a bit of time to have another quick round of questions. Um, and, and just, you know, reflecting on what you all have talked about, about the importance of relationships and uh, and bringing together different age groups. I'd like to turn again to you, Betty, and ask you, 
um, in your experience running intergenerational programs in particular, and you've talked about this a little bit, could you elaborate on what are some ways to better engage children and to help prepare them for interacting with uh, people living with uh, dementia? I would echo what Josie said, education. Because if you take a child, and my expertise is with junior high and high school, like teenagers, but children are no different. If you take a child into a care center or into a home and they meet somebody who has dementia, who is confused and the child realizes that, they don't know what to do. So in our field, before, before the students ever meet their senior friends, we do tons of training. For example, first I had to do training. So I went to the Alzheimer's Society here in Calgary and I took some courses so that I could fully understand. And then I created my own training program. And so I incorporated that in all of the training even if they didn't, they weren't going to this one specific care center for any care center that we went to, or even if they're in a community. And then um, for the care center where all the residents had mid to late dementia, then the CEO of that care center spent an extra hour with the students to train them. And so once that training was done, then they could be sensitive and they could have huge understanding and it really prepared them so that when they went in and of course they were scared the first time but there's always staff around like they're never alone and so when they went the first time and they were nervous but by the end of the hour they were not nervous anymore and another thing we did was um, we always had activities like we never left them alone and said, oh, so just go and spend an hour because what are you going to do? So I provided activities and they were intentional activities. And then the training also helped them to know what to do if their friends did not want to do that activity. So training is the key, I think. And, and I think that's just coming out from everything that you have been saying, all three of you, that, you know, it's a lot about awareness and education, uh, and not only of, you know, let's say if you're talking about children, not just the children, but people around them. Um, and a big part of creating dementia inclusive communities and programs is raising awareness. So I'd like to ask you, Kat Katrina, um, what are some things that organizations could do, not only just to increase their own awareness, as we just heard from Dati, that's very important as well, but also the awareness of the people and communities they serve? Um, sorry, I want to make sure I wasn't on mute. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that... Uh, in, in, in terms of the awareness piece, so throughout our project, we did create an awareness campaign. Uh, the campaign consisted initially of almost a, um, we called it the shock part of the campaign. It had, it had visuals and images of, of persons who had dementia. And one, one visual would have been of a woman whose face was shattered. And the caption underneath was, dementia does not need to shatter a life. Um, that campaign was the first phase and it ran on all of our social media platforms. And we encouraged people to comment on how that visual made them feel. And it was really interesting to see the comments that we received, which was, this makes me feel very uncomfortable. This makes me feel like we're not supporting people living with dementia or I hope I never get dementia. The second phase of our awareness campaign was all around creating a more positive um, image, which was showing people living with dementia, participating in dance classes, participating in having conversations with children or reading stories to children, um, participating uh, by going out socially, going to a restaurant, enjoying a meal, 
And then we asked people to comment about their thoughts when they saw those images. And of course it was like, I never realized that someone with dementia could still uh, take dance classes. Or I never realized that someone living with dementia still could go to a restaurant and enjoy a meal. So then it came about overcoming those, those um, uh, uh, stereotypical ideas that people have about dementia. And in order to overcome that, that's where the training and the um, the awareness piece comes in, right? So that's where we supported the um, the campaign with our training, um, and specifically with businesses such as uh, restaurants, coffee shops, uh, retail spaces. We focused our training on some of the physical changes that those. Um, uh, businesses could make so that the business would be more welcoming for people living with dementia. Um, one story I would like to share is uh, the Giant Tiger retail example. Um, we went into the Giant Tiger in Arnprior. We delivered the training to their management and their employees. And after the training, uh, I actually go in and I do a physical review of the space. And so I do a walkthrough with the store manager. We look at lighting, we look at the flooring to make sure that it's not uneven, that it's not busy, that it's uh, well laid out. We look at signage to make sure that you can read it, that the font is large enough, that it's at eye level and not too high. We look at to see if they have uh, places where people can sit if they need some time to rest. But then we got to the public washroom we opened up the door to the public washroom and everything was white. The walls, the floor, the sink, the toilet. And the manager at the store uh, confided in me and he said, you know, we've had some accidents in our public washroom. And after taking the training, I now realize why our clients are having accidents in our washroom. It's because it was monochromatic there was no distinction between where the toilet was and where the sink was and where the soap and the paper towel was. Everything looked like a blur to someone living with dementia or someone with poor eyesight. So what the manager did is he gave his staff $100. That was it. And he said, I need you to transform this washroom. And within a week, the staff had transformed the washroom. They found a black toilet seat that they put on top of the white toilet. They put a mirror up with black edging so that you could now clearly see the mirror. They changed the color of the door because it was white as well. So it was sometimes difficult to find where you should exit. Um, they painted the door a different color. Um, and you know what? Clients noticed. They said to the manager, we love what you've done with your washroom. This is fantastic. Um, so those are some of the things that we did, did to create awareness. That's such a beautiful story. I mean, it's, it's such something so small, but so impactful. Yeah. And, and that actually, I, I'd like to talk more about that. And I'd like to ask Jose a little bit, because you have done this as well. Um, what, what kind of things can we consider, like what just Katarina described, when creating dementia-friendly spaces, and, and not just in terms of the physical spaces, that's very important as well, but also in other ways, like uh, through interactions or, um, you know, way people uh, can reduce uh, anxiety or stigma around this. Again, it, it's all about education. Knowledge is power. Uh, the, the more, the more friendly community training we do, the more equipped uh, the community will be to engage with people living with dementia. So for example, some, uh, some um, especially one store in, in our area uh, develop a slow line, a slow line, uh, a slow checkout uh, geared towards people with, let's call it disability just so um, they, they, they can, well, take their time because we all know uh, at the end of the day, if someone is slow in front of us and we, well, people feel it, right? People do feel it when, when you have someone behind you that because you're looking for your, 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 you're thinking about your pin, you're doing this, you're doing that. So it, it can cause a lot of anxiety to to a person living with dementia. And sometimes even their care partner are, are with them, but 
we want uh, people with dementia to be independent for as long as possible. So they are still able to do a lot of things because there's a life after a diagnosis. You said it so well, Katerina, that, I mean, there's so many things they can do. Uh, we, we just need to, um, to teach, to educate people in, you know, people can dance, people can have amazing stories to share with us. They can show us a lot of things. Uh, I deal with, with a lady that is, she's, she's a nurse, you know, once a nurse, always a nurse. And, and she is pretty advanced. However, if you ask her for guidance, because you have an issue, I mean, she's on the ball. She can barely talk. But when you ask her, you know what, Jeanette, what can I do with my hands? They hurt so much. I have arthritis. And I mean, she's on the ball. So again, it, it, it's about our connection with the people. And Katerina, when you said that you went through the giant tiger and you went through everything, well, People with dementia, their vision change, you know, it, it, it's like this. So we almost have to go around the store and and put ourselves in, 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 in their shoes and look at what they see, look at what they don't see. Images uh, and, and you're right, changing of colors. Sometimes it takes just a little thing and it can make a world of difference. So if I can summarize everything, it, it brings us back to education and a person-centered care, because when you see one person with dementia, you see one person with dementia. So giving them the opportunity to share with us their concerns uh, and, and adapting our life and our world and try to look at the way they see the world. And I think they will live so well and with well-being, you know, throughout that journey. And when we do support the person with dementia, we're supporting a whole lot of people because about 10 people are impacted by that disease. So, I mean, that has quite the effect on our community, family, and all. Yeah, thank you so much, Josie. I think there's, there's so many insights there that I think, you know, we'll take away and reflect on. Uh, and I do have other questions, but I'm also watching the clock. So I think uh, uh, just to wrap up before we uh, open up to the audience, um, I'd love to hear, and, and you've already shared a lot. I mean, you've shared a lot of your personal stories and professional stories in this. Um, but I would love to hear if there's any particular story that comes to mind uh, from your experiences that really encapsulates, you know, the positive outcome uh, that comes from creating dementia inclusive programs, intergenerational programs and other programs in communities. I would love to share one, <laughs> a care center that I've been mentioning. There was one of the residents, I'm going to call her May, and she didn't speak. She always came to the program and this, she always had the same two students. She had this huge smile on her, and but she didn't speak. The recreational therapist told me that on Monday mornings, when she saw May, she said, hi, May, today's Monday. And May's eyes lit up and she spoke. She said, today the kids are coming. Mm -hmm. And then one day, it was, the kids went every Monday after school. And so she used a walker. And one time she was getting up from the table and I made sure that I took the walker and I was holding it so that when she stood up, she could maintain her balance. She was this far away from me. We had never heard her speak. She was this far away from my face and she had this huge smile. She said, see you next Monday. And that to me, that was payday. 
I feel that's beautiful. I'll be welling up probably over the next yeah. uh, few seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Day. That's that's really amazing. Katerina or Jose, would you like to uh, share any more stories? Um, well, I, I could share um, back to the giant tiger example. Um, like I said, it took a long time to develop the relationship and it was one store that we started with. But as a result of doing the work in that one store, we were able to be introduced to the head office and we co-developed a training program, which is now offered across Canada for all of Giant Tiger management and employees. And um, because Giant Tiger serves in our smaller communities and they tend to serve the senior population, um, we've heard really good feedback about the program and how employees feel much better able now to, to help their customers that are seniors. Wow. Talk about impact. It's amazing. Um, thank you for sharing. Josie, do you have any uh, anything more to share? Uh, there, there are a lot of stories I can share, but... Um, uh, one experience, uh, it was not quite... With, the, the the way Betty and Katerina Katerina described their stories, but uh, it was in regards of music. Um, I I uh, have a program called Minds in Motions, and um, of course we do a lot of things to to um, to keep the brain healthy as possible. And this is a person with dementia and their caregiver. Uh, doing a uh, eight week session block and anyway we have quite a bit of music but we have one person in particular that has a lot of aphasia where she doesn't she barely talks it, it, it it's yes and it's no basically and uh, I have a good friend that um, he's an entertainer and he's a Elvis impersonator so he came and he did a show for us and it was just amazing. She sang throughout the hour, words for words. And afterwards, after, after he was done, she was talking. She was engaging with us. Wow, good, nice, fun. She, it was just amazing. So it's... It, it, the impact we can have on those people and on their caregiver. Can you imagine the caregiver? Wow. So these are beautiful story that there is a life after diagnosis, even later on, on their journey. Absolutely. That's beautiful. And just shows that it's, it's people and it's, there's a heart to the work that is being done, um, you know, and any one person I think that we can make a difference in the life of is already a great result. Um, and now I think that brings us to the end. I'd like to uh, have some time also uh, for any questions, comments, or even stories from uh, people who've joined uh, participants. Thank you so much, Betty, Josie, and Katerina for sharing uh, from your experience and uh, your expertise.